building beneficial and constructive relationships, supporting tribes in restoring their role as land stewards, and elevating and integrating Native communities into the planning and decision-making for a healthy and resilient Bay. We acknowledge that we are on the ancestral territory of the Native peoples of the San Francisco Bay, including the numerous villages and tribes of the Ohlone, Patwin, Coast Miwok, and Bay Miwok. I, in Santa Cruz County, am on the tribal territory of the Ohlone. We recognize that through a violent history of colonization and dispossession, today as guests, we benefit from living and working on the traditional homeland of these Native people. We wish to show our respect to them and their ancestors by acknowledging the injustices inherent to this history and by reaffirming their sovereign rights and their current efforts to achieve restorative justice. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, it is vitally important that we recognize the land on which we reside is unceded tribal territory and also acknowledge and support the Native people that continue to form a crucial part of our San Francisco Bay Area community today. I would now like to introduce our MC for today, Dr. Tom Mumley. Tom has been the chair of the RMP Steering Committee since 2011, but he's been involved in the program much longer than that, helping to create the RMP in 1993, participating in several RMP work groups, and serving as a member of the steering committee since 2007. Tom has worked at the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board for 38 years and is currently an assistant executive officer with the board. Tom works in many program areas, including development and implementation of water quality standards, TMDLs, NPDES, wastewater and stormwater permits, and enforcement. Welcome, Tom. Well, thank you, Melissa. And uh, welcome our, our Regional Monitoring Program family, as I do every year when I have the privilege of introducing the, the meeting, I, I, I like to call out about how great this this opportunity is that we've created this regional monitoring program and the spirit of collaboration that it's fueled. And, uh, and I like to quote what a point that Luisa Valiela has said a couple of years back, this is a, these RNP annual meetings are a great day for water quality in San Francisco Bay. So, so here we are again for our annual celebration of, of our ongoing collaboration and, and reaping the benefits of this great uh, regional monitoring program that we have. So uh, thank you all. And, and despite the challenges we've all faced with this past year plus with the pandemic, it, it, I could say with great certainty, we've, we've prevailed. We, the RNP has continued to do most everything we, we hope to do. We've had some, perhaps some challenges with field work Etc. But uh, probably the bigger challenge for field work was climate and the, the lack of runoff events to for our some of our special studies last winter. Hopefully this year won't be the same. But so let's let's carry on. What what next slide, please? I want to first call attention to the just hot off the press is the the regional monitor program annual. Uh, report the update 2021 it's now been posted you'll see the posted you can find it at the SFEI website and um, actually sub shortly you'll any of you on our mailing list uh, email list will get an email from Jake uh, just, uh, explaining how to get a hard copy so you don't have to email him if you're already on our uh, our list and it, it's as usual Jay does a super job with this report. And I want to call attention to 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 that. Not only is it an update on recent studies and data, Jay does a super job of of uh, highlighting like the top ten recent activities and accomplishments, as well as forecasting, uh, pointing out what what's in play, what's what's coming ahead. And actually, the the number one uh, point he makes in the top ten it gives me cause to show the next slide, please. Is, is, is recognizing that we we won a national award uh, last year, just recently the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, that's, that, that's our municipal wastewater treatment agencies throughout the country. 
uh, do envir National Environmental Achievement Awards every year, and they awarded the Regional Monitoring Program uh, one of their awards for watershed collaboration. And as what's stated here is what we we already knew. I mean, we are we celebrate this every year the uh, the spirit of collaboration, the joint fact finding approach that we 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 take on, and how we all work together well. Uh, as we've noted in the past, not only throughout California, throughout the country, people are just at awe of what we do here. So uh, we 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 knew this, but it's certainly welcome some additional attention. And uh, I want to shout, give a shout out and, and say thank you to East, East Bay Municipal Utility District led by Eileen White, who actually essentially unilaterally put together this nomination for us. So thank you, Eileen. So let's, let's next slide is just a brief overview of, it's an overview of today's program, we have four sessions, first on sediment, followed by one with, with issues most relevant to municipal wastewater. And then in the afternoon, we have one with issues more relevant to stormwater. And then we finish with an update on sport fish and other monitoring programs, but then a, a, a session on how we, we are using RMP data to inform decisions. But oh, hold on a second. Oh, my. Folks, I, I just got a report that there's there, there there's going to be a significant discharge to San Francisco Bay tonight. Okay. Oh, yeah. So what the news is the San Francisco Giants are going to discharge numerous baseballs into McCove, McCovey Cove. But oh, not to worry, because a flotilla of concern. Citizens has already been assembled, and so they will be out on the bay immediately recovering any of these discharges. So fortunately, we're okay. Although I can't, we're not too sure that we can uh, resolve any issues with Dodger discharges, but we can actually say to the San Francisco Giants that they're welcome to discharge as many balls into McCovey Cove as they possibly can, which in other words, go Giants. So, uh, all right, not to worry, all good. So, uh, yeah, I think a few of us will be paying attention to those hopeful discharges tonight. So with that, I'm gonna just move us into the first session and it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the first session, Luisa Valiela who, from US EPA. I, I think most of you, if all of you know Luisa, she's a great, champion of the Bay and Estuary from US EPA, very engaged in many things, particularly the regional monitoring program, active participant on the on our technical review committee. So uh, with that, Louisa, uh, carry on. Thanks, Tom. And hello to all the attendees uh, that have joined us this, work, this morning. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Um, as moderator, my main job is to keep us on schedule. So I will begin with the briefest of comments and then introduce the first of our four session speakers. We're kicking off the Regional Monitoring Program's annual meeting with the topic of sediment. Yep, mud, muck, dirt, maybe some sand and gravel thrown in there. Why, you ask, did these nerdy scientists not ask anybody else what people would want to hear about? Microplastics, you say. Um, everyone's talking about PFAS. What about eating fish from the bay? I know. We will get to all of those other fascinating topics today, too. But sediment, it's an unsung hero. Creating a long term data set to better understand sediment, both in the bay and in its watersheds, is a work in progress. But some things we know now. Remarkably, suspended sediment has been a major factor in preventing San Francisco Bay from suffering major harmful algal blooms, even though we are a nutrient enriched estuary. Sediment, it, it makes up the mudflats where birds of the Pacific Flyway depend on as a food source. And sediment, it is now going to be more precious than gold in terms of getting more of it into our shorelines if we are going to help wetlands keep up with sea level rise. I hope you will all come to appreciate the charisma of sediment um, with our first slate of speakers today. Fittingly, Dr. Bruce Jaffe will start us off in summarizing his three decades of work 
in San Francisco Bay. Dr. Jaffe is with the U.S. Geological Survey in Santa Cruz and studies the evolution of estuaries and sediment transport during storms. He's interested in the drivers for long-term morpholo morphologic change, including sea level rise and climate change, and the effects of large events like tsunamis. He lives close to the beach, loves playing beach volleyball, and riding his bike in the forest. Dr. Jaffe? Thank you, Lisa. And it's music to my ears that uh, sediment is getting due justice in this meeting. Okay. <clears throat> so since the mid nineties, we've been looking at uh, how San Francisco Bay has changed over the last 160 years. Uh, many different uh, agencies and groups have funded this work. This is a partial list um, and collaborators include NOAA. And many people have contributed to this study. Um, without all this hard work, what I'm presenting today wouldn't be possible. So the main points for those of you who may have to leave or Bruce, sorry, uh, can you share your screen? Perfect, thank go, you. Yeah, I won't go back into this other than to say, here's the slide on the, uh, the funding sources. This is the slide on the collaborator, other people who contributed to the study. And here are the main points. Thank you for letting me know that I wasn't sharing. So the main points are that, uh, through the analysis of these multiple surveys that, that occurred between the 1850s and the uh, 2010s, um, it revealed that the Bay gained sediment up until the overall, up until the 1950s, and then lost sediment afterwards. Uh, but the volumes and patterns are very complex of where the sediment was was gained and where it was lost, and it changed over uh, time and space. And that uh, this data set we found is very useful for understanding the center of transport, uh, validating and developing morphodynamic models, uh, looking at uh, how habitat has changed in the past and, and forecasts for how it'll change in the future. Um, distribution of leg legacy contaminants and improving the forecasts for how the bay will change uh, in response to sea level rise and climate change. So today I'm going to um, talk about the bathymetric surveys and then get into the, the, what we've learned from data analysis and how it's changed since the 1850s, but gonna be emphasizing uh, the latest period, the 1980s to 2010s, uh, which is, we're just about to get a publication out on that. And then I'm gonna summarize and talk about future work. So the first comprehensive surveys when we of San Francisco Bay in the 1850s and 1860s, the methods, uh, lead line, holes. Here's an example of the data collected for, this is South, South Bay. And um, in all throughout the Bay, there were over 100,000 soundings collected. Techniques, instrumentation has, has changed. The latest bathymetric surveys use multi beam or interferometric side scan uh, and a swath bathymetry, many, many points collected. Uh, probably on the order of hundreds of millions of point, data points, as dense as one point every square meter of bay floor. This is uh, what the data looks like. Uh, this is published now, uh, Teresa Fregoso and others. Uh, you can see areas, can you see my um, pointer, hopefully? Um, where it's dark and looks like it's totally shaded in, that's multi-beam data. And then where there's these uh, 
They're not lines, they're actually swaths, um, is the interferometric uh, side scan sonar. And it is intentional to leave spaces between the swaths because just the costs were prohibitive to get complete coverage in the shallow waters. So the process for both working, um, analyzing the historical data and the uh, recent data is similar. Uh, the historical data, the soundings had to be uh, digitized, but um, a key part of our curating a bathymetric surface is uh, adding contours. It constrains the interpolation between data points. And then for both the uh, historical and the recent surveys, uh, the, the surface that was created was error checked, the data was error checked, and then it was an iterative process of creating a new surface and then making sure that it honored the, the data, uh, revising and error checking again, and coming up with the final surface. So in all, there were uh, six surveys um, six, and the details for these surveys can be found in the, in the uh, reports and publications listed to the left and the details of the analysis and the trends for each southern data. Uh, except for the, the 2010s, I, which is, um, that data is published, but the analysis of change is just completing and the publication is uh, soon going to be out. So again, highlighting 2010s. So how has the day changed? Um, the way we determine the changes, we take the bathymetric surface grids and we difference them. And we have to first bring them to a common vertical datum because the datum has changed over time. So this is the complete picture of the, the five different uh, survey uh, change, excuse me, change periods. The reds are where there was a gain of sediment and the blues are where there was a loss of sediment. And there's many different patterns here. And um, I could talk for hours about this, but I'll just point out that during the hydraulic mining period, the North Bay is very red, 1850s to 1890s, as a sediment was deposited there. And afterwards, uh, and especially in the latest periods, the bay is, um, has lost sediment and it, there's erosion that's occurred. So focusing in on the 1980s to 2010s, um, the San Pablo Bay lost about 17 million cubic meters of sediment. Uh, there was a slight gain in uh, Central Bay, 3 million cubic meters and a loss in South Bay, about 10 million cubic meters. Um, and Sassoon Bay wasn't a complete survey, but of what was surveyed, about 25 million cubic meters. And, but you can see there's, these numbers are net numbers and there's, uh, there's a big, there, there's many strong, there's many areas where there's, uh, even in areas where there's loss, where there's uh, gain and, areas where there's gain, there's, there's strong patterns of loss. I want to point out there's missing data, especially in the latest survey. So we, in terms of a net sediment volume change in the entire bay, we, we have to, to temper our conclusions. So one of the issues with, with the recent set of surveys is that it spans quite a large period of time, 1999 to 2020. And so to normalize by time, it's instructive to look at the rates of change. So 
in the 1980s to 2010s, much of the bay, there was less than a centimeter per year of change in the, in the bay floor level. But there were areas where it was 10 centimeters or more. So comparing this to the previous time period, you can see the overall impression is it's less blue, especially in South Bay. Um, and the, there are some strong patterns. Uh, the, one of the, some of the patterns, the shapes indicate that it's not natural. Other patterns are created like in uh, San Pablo Bay, the stripes are from channels narrowing the red is deposition on the margins. And in the other areas, you can see channel migration or deepening where you get a strong uh, signal. So one of the, the, the signatures and that you see very clearly is places where sediments been removed from the bay. Um, this is from the 1950s to 1980s. Uh, we're still um, in future work. We're going to be analyzing patterns more and accounting for this and how it affects the net amount in the bay. Uh, but in the 1950s, 1980s, there was uh, more than 50 million cubic meters of sediment removed. And from Central Bay, 60% of the sediment loss was from human activities. So I'm going to next show a zoom in here to this area and compare the 19th. Uh, 50s, 1980s to the 1980s to 2010s. So in the 1950s, 1980s, you can see these patterns um, where the, the uh, where there was sediment removed borrow areas um, pointing to two areas here. Um, near the Oakland airport and the upper arrow on the left-hand side. And then um, a kind of a rectangular shape, sharp boundaries uh, where sediment was taken uh, to build up the land for Foster Island. Um, and one of the, something that, that we're seeing in this latest survey that latest time change period is that these holes that were created, and this is makes sense, they, they enhance deposition. So these holes are filling up and um, these volumes are uh, significant. The two arrows point to two areas of, on the right. These areas, this is 11 million, cubic meters of deposition near uh, Oakland Airport and 4 million cubic meters near um, for the Foster Island Bar. So looking at the bay as a whole over time by sub um there's each sub embayment has a, a signature, although there's similarities between sub Um The San Pablo Bay has a very strong signal for hydraulic mining uh, during that, that period where hydraulic mining was occurring and thereafter as well. And then after 1950s became uh, lost sediment from erosion primarily. And then, uh, whereas in Sassoon Bay had a hydraulic mining signature, but it lost the sediment that came in more quickly starting in the late 1800s. And South Bay and Central Bay each have their signature as well. 
So overall, and I've got for the entire bay and tires in quotes because not the the area of the survey varied with the time period. Um, the last data point doesn't include Sassoon Bay and perhaps there'd be more erosion. And so this would be a lower net, but the sediment that came in during the hydraulic mining debris, uh, during the hydraulic mining uh, period, uh, the debris from the mining operations is uh, still in the bay. Uh, and it kept coming along with other sediment to the 1950s and then uh, started losing the sediment. Excuse me. So that brings us to the summary and future work. So the summary is the same as the main points. And as I, the last slide showed that the bay overall gained sediment to the 1950s and lost sediment afterwards. And that the earlier slide showed just how complex the pattern is of sediment gain and loss and how it changed over time and space. And then uh, the final point, haven't had time to talk about all the applications of this. There have been uh, over a dozen publications on, on these different aspects, but sediment, how using this data is useful for validating and developing models and understanding the sediment transport and improving the, uh, the forecast of how the bay will change in response to sea level rise and climate change. And with that, the future work, um, the latest time period, 18, 1980s to the 2010s, is going to uh, be published soon, very soon. Um, and future work, something that's been very interesting is to look at the morphodynamic. I should have defined that. Um, that's uh, hydrodynamic sediment transport and morpho morphologic change, how that responds to sea level rise and climate change. And then there's been modeling work done on that and uh, more modeling work will be done in the future. Um, a sediment budget is, is being prepared uh, and the bathymetric change is going to uh, be a major component of that to look at whether the bay is the source or sink of sediment. And um, there's been some work done on forecasting habitat change, in particular mudflats, uh, whether or not the um, sea level rise will overwhelm the mudflats or not, and what the factors are, including sediment supply and uh, the forcing like waves and currents and how that affects that. And then in the bottom right, I have a, a photo that, a, photo, a figure from the a publication by Sean Higgins and others, 2007, where um, the age of the near surface uh, sediment was reconstructed from a series of bathymetric surveys. And it, this could be useful for to improve understanding of legacy contaminants. It might be hard to read this, but the greens, that's uh, from the 1850s. Uh, so this is where hydraulic mining debris is near the surface in San Pablo Bay, these green areas. And then the reds are where uh, this was done uh, with only, when there's only the 1983 survey, so this can be updated, where uh, sediment is being deposited. Um, and so the sediment is younger. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Jaffe. I um, thank you um, attendees for putting your questions into the chat. Um, we see them. Um, to keep us on time, I'm just going to do one clarifying question and we will save um, all the other questions for our moderated Q&A after all the speakers have gone. But um, Bruce, there is a question um, that came in kind of 
in the middle of your talk when you were talking about the areas that were specifically dredged for large, um, like the airports and, and developments. Um, but the question from George Robinson asked, how do you account for dredging activities and impacts in your analysis? And I think that's probably referring more to routine dredging. Can you right. that a question you can answer now? Uh, yes, it's an easy answer. We're working on it. <laughs> um, and would like all the help we can get. Uh, so that would, so what we need to know is how much is dredged and where it's placed. So, um, but that, that, that's something that, that can be done and should be done. Excellent. Well, we do have a lot of other questions um, close to 10 at this point. Um, so we will save those. Okay, thank you very much. You, um, I will now introduce the next two speakers. Uh, Dr. Maureen Downing Kuntz's specialty is field-based explorations of estuary sediment transport and water quality. The work she will share here today was conducted while employed at USGS, the US Geological Survey, focused on the San Francisco estuary. Dr. Downing Kuntz recently moved from the USGS to ESA to work more directly in environmental restoration using her degree in civil and environmental engineering. She loves being outside and exploring our public lands with her family, and is passionate about restoring our relationship with our environment and our more than human relatives. And by that, I'm sure she means sediment. Following um, Dr. Downing Kuntz will be Dr. Michael McWilliams. He is a principal engineer at Anchor QEA. He has more than 20 years of experience developing and applying hydrodynamic wave, salinity, temperature, sediment transport, and morphological models in large estuarine systems like San Francisco Bay and Chesapeake Bay. His experience includes modeling to evaluate analysis of the effects of sea level rise and applying models to evaluate and design coastal and wetland restoration projects. I will now turn it over to Dr. Downing Kuntz. Um, are you able to share your screen? Yeah, excellent. Yes. Okay. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here today with my co-presenter, Michael. Uh, we are here to present some of our findings on the topic of sediment flux through the Golden Gate. I'm going to start by providing some of our work that was based on the, the field observation side, and then I'll give it over to Michael, who did a modeling study. And so before I get started, I wanted to say thank you to Melissa for the invitation to be here today. Uh, this meeting has long been one of my most favorites, and I wanted to echo what Tom said, is that this community do, does indeed feel like family. And I also wanted to express gratitude to my employer, Environmental Science Associates, for the support that allows me to be here today. And before I get started, I did want to just for transparency say that um, I did do this work while working at the USGS with my colleagues. Um, I no longer work with USGS and the content that I'm sharing here is from material that has been approved for public release. And I'm really excited to share with you our 2021 paper um, that will describe this work in much more detail. So to give you some background, um, San Francisco Bay receives um, watershed inflow and sediment discharge from the Central Valley and from smaller local tributaries. From previous studies, we know that sediment supply to the bay has changed over time. And one important motivation for this work was to improve our understanding of the San Francisco Bay sediment budget and this budget is really important to managers when we're thinking about how to best handle things like navigation dredging, contaminant transport, shoreline resilience, and many other important topics. And um, before I go too much further, I wanted to try to get us all on the same page with some terminology. And so um, I'll be talking about flux, which is the rate of transport at a cross section is computed as the product of discharge, which is also considered velocity times cross-sectional area, and then multiply that by the concentration, in this case, of sediment. And this is different from a budget, which is a way to account for sediment gains and losses within a region of interest. And um, so some of the important stuff that Bruce was mentioning in his presentation, we talk about the important, like what's happening with the sediment within, if you think about the San Francisco Bay as our region of interest, um, everything that Bruce was talking about would be stuff that's happening with sediment internally and um, thinking about the inflow that would be from the watershed and then outflow for our system is at the Golden Gate. 
And so the change in storage of sediment within the bay is the sum of the inflows minus the outflows, which sounds really simple, but it's not. So sediment budgets um, in the, from the past have shown that suspended sediment flux at the Golden Gate is the largest and most uncertain term. This is a, a table of um, the different authors and years and methods and um, values of sediment outflow at the Golden Gate to the Pacific Ocean. You can see there's a pretty large range in, in magnitude there. And so our objective in this field work was to collect sediment flux measurements during high watershed runoff um, and build upon existing work done by, for example, Lee Erickson and her colleagues. And so you might be wondering, well, what's so hard about working at the Golden Gate? It's this really defined, pretty obvious cross-section, uh, the, con the, the confluence and um, joining with the Pacific Ocean. And uh, the reason for this is that everything about the Golden Gate is extreme. The depths exceed 300 feet at the deepest. The currents are exceptionally fast. Uh, there's an average of six feet of change from high tide to low tide. And uh, a really large volume of water is transported through the Golden Gate on every single tide. And so um, to try to show you what we were doing, this is uh, an oblique view looking into San Francisco Bay. And so we're thinking about sediment flux as the product of discharge and times con and concentration at this cross-sectional area um, that you can see. Ideally, we'll be working right below the Golden Gate Bridge. And keep in mind that sediment flux is directional. There, there is sediment that um, can be transported in and out of the bay, depending on the tide. And so um, an instrument of choice for this work is called an acoustic Doppler current profiler or ADCP. I like to think of it as the sediment flux whisperer. This um, instrument uses acoustic energy and transmits into the water column is reflected off particles suspended in the water column. And from there we can compute, the instrument computes velocity and also acoustic backscatter. And so this is a, a schematic of kind of, of the, the gist of what we were doing. We attached our instrument to the side of our boat and then we, um, draw, we navigate along a cross section and we're obtaining velocity um, across the whole area of the channel. And then also we're getting information about the acoustic backscatter. And so we're using the same instrument for two measurements, first of discharge, the product of the velocity and the area, and then also sediment flux, which would be that the discharge and then multiply that by the concentration. And so the, one of the key parts of this, this method is to calibrate that backscatter to a suspended sediment concentration. And so the method that we did for that was to use a, a sampler that can take a water sample over a known time period at a specific depth. And then we um, also have the acoustic Doppler current profiler collecting backscatter at that same time, at the same depth. And from there, we can create a regression as shown down in the bottom of the slide where we've got the acoustic backscatter from the ADCP on the x-axis um, related to the sediment concentration in those water samples with a, a log transform relation to get a linear relationship there. And so just to kind of put it into perspective of what we were doing at the Golden Gate, um, we had a boat a little larger than this one, and um, we chose a cross section that was shown in this arc that is uh, landward of the Golden Gate. And this little red dot is to denote approximate size of our vessel. And so what we would, we had our acoustic uh, Doppler current profile attached to the boat and we were going along this transect back and forth um, for various parts of the tidal cycle. And so we had, we couldn't be directly below the Golden Gate Bridge um, primarily because of limitations of the, uh, when, you, when you choose the instrument, you have to pick a frequency and um, the, you have to make a trade off between how far deep into the water column the instrument can see and how sensitive it would be to sediment particles in the water, suspended in the water. And so just a couple photos from the field. We, the first trip out, we uh, were on the RV Questionary and it was a, an incredibly beautiful place to work. Uh, we had a second boat that was doing some sediment sampling, and most of the trip it was, was in deep fair weather. Uh, we did have one stormy day where I was very concerned about keeping my lunch <laughs> inside. It was uh, a pretty, pretty, pretty seasick, worthy day. Um, and then on this slide is a, a, a time series of, for each of the, the tidal signal um, at the, near the Golden Gate, 
um, for each of the three field campaigns. Um, and so that we've got the title stage over about a two day period and the, the dots on, on the curve denote when we were actually out collecting data with the ADCP. And so the point of this is to show that while we do have this really incredible spatial resolution, we weren't really able to be out there for much more than a title cycle per um, trip. And for example, the, the one in February 2017, which was the, the really large um, sediment outflow event, we, were, we worked overnight and um, still were only able to get uh, just over a full title cycle. And so, the, just, so to, to denote, we, we did have high spatial resolution, but very low temporal resolution. And um, so Michael's going to go into the results in much more detail, but I did want to just highlight a couple of things that we found. Um, and so this is a, so we had three field campaigns. Um, and so I'm just comparing the peak water flux, peak sediment flux, and the peak transect average sediment concentrations, and just comparing the ebb values and the flood values for each of these field days. And um, so the peak water flux was sort of like as expected because we had a generally have water entering San Francisco Bay from the watershed that's being transmitted to the ocean, the peak flux on the ebb tide was larger than that on the flood tide. That made sense. What was really interesting about our work is that for all of our field campaigns, generally we were seeing um, higher values of sediment flux and sediment concentrations on the flood tide compared to the ebb tide. And this was definitely um, not what we were expecting. And so this made us, um, really want to know what was happening for all the other times that we weren't on the boat and the, definitely um, started seeing that a, a modeling effort would be really important for this. And so I just wanted to talk about a couple of the challenges that we face from the field observation perspective is just um, getting the timing right and because we can't be out there for a really long period of time and so trying to figure out what's the most representative time to be out there is pretty tough. And uh, I did mention that there's the trade-off between the instrument, the range, the depth up to which the water, the instrument can see, and also the sensitivity to the size of the particles in the water. And for those that haven't had the experience of watching a large container ship enter underneath the Golden Gate, they move really fast. So we've got to do some evasive maneuvers out there. And so um, where we left things in the in our previous work was, or the end of our of our study was to say that the next steps um, that we thought were really important were to do some modeling exercise to relate what we have observed in the field to the numerical modeling. And so with that, I will hand it over to Michael. Thank you. All right, thank you, Maureen. So um, first I just wanna acknowledge uh, the USGS for working with us and sharing their data for use in the modeling study and also for the uh, RMP for, for funding this effort. Um, the focus of the modeling study uh, was to evaluate the model sediment flux through the Golden Gate and compare that to the USGS database estimate of, of sediment flux. And the period that we focused on was the, the February uh, 2017 measurement. So the way we did this is we first simulated uh, hydrodynamics waves and sediment transport uh, throughout the whole uh, Bay Delta. And we validated the model to predicted sediment concentrations uh, throughout the estuary, not just at, at the Golden Gate. And then we uh, used that model to compare the USGS estimated sediment flux to the modeled sediment flux, uh, and also to then use the model to evaluate the sediment flux over a longer uh, time period. So the model that we use for this is the Unstrom Bay Delta model. It's a 3D hydrodynamic model that uh, spans from Point Reyes in the Pacific Ocean through the entire uh, Bay Delta system. It includes um, inflows from all the primary uh, bay and delta tributaries, as well as sediment inflows um, from those. We have um, all the different water intakes and exports in the delta, uh, as well as um, spatially variable evaporation, precipitation, and wind. Uh, Delta Island consumptive use, which is the use of, of water in the delta, and then the, the various control structures in the delta. For this project, we have the untrim model coupled with the uh, a swan wave model. And the, uh, the swan wave model runs uh, basically hourly to calculate the significant wave heights in the bay. And wind waves are extremely important, important for sediment transport, um, especially for resuspending sediment in some of the shallow areas of the bay. And then the model is also coupled to the sedimorph uh, morphologic model. 
and this coupling uh, happens every single time step, which in this case was every 45 seconds. Essentially, the the model predicted current speeds and the wave uh, properties are passed to the uh, morphologic model, and the shear stress is computed within each grid cell and compared to the um, critical shear stress of the sediment. And then there's a direct feedback in that there can be erosion and deposition in each cell based on um, the hydrodynamics and sediment properties. And then the uh, model uh, changes the bathymetry if there's erosion and deposition. So there's a, a direct feedback um, to, to that. For the sediment flux calculation, we focused uh, on the Golden Gate. And uh, as Maureen uh, talked about, the, you know, the ideal cross section is straight across uh, the Golden Gate. And then for the sampling, for various reasons, it's a lot easier to work on this um, uh, landward side of uh, just to the east of the Golden Gate. Um, one of the advantages um, of the model is we can sample everywhere at the same time, whereas when you're on a boat, you can sample at one spot. So we, from the model, looked at sediment flux two different ways. Um, the first is we sampled the model um, exactly as if we were on a boat uh, going along the USGS transect. So um, there were 32 transects uh, where the USGS went back and forth roughly along this line. And we know where the boat was at each time along that transect for a vertical profile. So we can sample the model um, in the same way by looking straight down at those locations, getting the concentrations and the velocities. And then we also um, know precisely what the model is predicting through a nice straight line across the cross section in terms of every 45 seconds. We know from the model what the prediction is for the amount of flow of water and the flow of sediment. And by comparing those two, we can also look at whether there's any uh, potential biases in the, the way that the data is being uh, collected. So of the, the 32 uh, transects, we'll look at a couple here. Um, just to orient you to what you're seeing on these figures, the top panel shows the observed and the bottom panel shows the predicted. On the left is the velocity and on the right is the suspended sediment concentration. Um, and zero is uh, on the south here. So essentially this is the beginning of ebb flow. So ebb, ebb colors here are blue. Um, you can see the highest observed velocities here uh, on the north bank, um, highest here with some areas of lower um, velocity in, in the middle. And you can see in general the predicted concentrations and uh, are pretty similar to the observed uh, concentrations. As we uh, reach kind of towards the end of ebb flow, decreasing ebb flow, you can see that the um, observed velocity uh, decreases here. Um, this is kind of the area near uh, Fort Point. There's a little bit of a, a back eddy here. Um, the model's capturing that as well. And you can see you know higher velocities here. Um, throughout here. So the, in general, the velocities are pretty similar. Um, one thing we notice here towards the end of ebb, the model tends to predict in general um, higher concentrations here than we see um, in the observation. Uh, this is near slack tide. Um, before flood, we can see the flow starting to reverse. So the, um, the flood tide here is starting near the bed in the observed and in the, the model predicted while there's still um, some ebb going on at the surface. Um, we see some areas of higher concentration here in the observations kind of corresponding to this band of low velocity. Um, but again, here at, at the slack before flood, the model tends to predict a little bit higher concentration. Um, as we move into increasing flood flow, uh, we see, you know, the highest velocities kind of in this um, core region through here, uh, both observed and predicted, um, not actually near the surface. There's actually lower velocities and some reverse flows um, near the surface. Um, and more similar concentrations here again between um, the observed and predicted. So if we look at all 32 of these transects together, um, first looking at water flux through the Golden Gate, we can get estimates from these 32 different transects of what the um, observed flow is. And these are these orange dots through here, um, ebb tide followed by flood tide. And if we sample the model exactly the same way as the ADCP, we get the, with these green dots, which are the model predictions, um, we see they pretty much follow the same uh, uh, trends. And if we compare that to the continuous flow through the straight line across the Golden Gate, we see that the blue and the green um, pretty much overlap each other, which indicates that um, here for the water flow, we're not seeing very much difference in, in whether we're sampling the model at the Golden Gate or along the transect that the USGS followed. There are a few differences. Um, 
the model predicts slightly larger ebb flow, um, primarily due to this single data point here, um, and, and slightly uh, smaller uh, flood flow uh, right here. But in general, it's within a few percent of the um, observation. So in general, the, the water predictions um, were very similar to the observation. When we look at the sediment flux, um, again, we have 32 measurements of sediment flux from these orange uh, points. And then the model predictions are the green uh, dots shown through here. Um, in general, the model predicts uh, larger ebb sediment flux, which you, can, which you can see right here, and a lower uh, flood sediment flux um, than the measured. Um, you know, this, this may look like it's um, fairly different, but if you keep in mind that the, you know, the sediment uh, flux estimate that Maureen showed in her slides earlier on, um, you know, they're somewhere in a, the order of a factor of four to 20 uh, difference in the sediment flux estimates. This is still relatively close um, overall, but there are some, some things that we wanted to look at in more detail. If we plot the predicted water flux on the uh, y-axis and they observe water flux on the x-axis, we can see that um, in general, most of the points fall right along this one-to-one -one line, indicating that the model is doing a good job predicting um, water flux. And if we do the same with the sediment flux, um, in general, most of the points are again falling pretty close along this one-to-one -one line, um, but there's a few points that stand out. Um, these purple, uh, one circled here in purple, these are where we have higher predicted than observed ebb flux, and then these the points here are where we have lower uh, predicted than observed uh, flood flux. Another way that we can look at the sediment flux is if we look at the average um, concentration of each cross section. Um, the sediment flux equals the flow time to concentration, and it's you know integrated over the the complexity of both the the velocity and the the cross section. But on average, the model predicts very similar uh, concentrations across these 32 transects, um, 46.8 milligrams per liter versus 47.9 um, for the data, these kind of shown by these kind of two dashed lines. But we do see some differences in the, the pattern. Um, so the peaks in the observations tend to occur at peak flood ebb and peak flood. And then the peaks in the model uh, in terms of concentration tend to occur um, towards the end of ebb. So I think there's two kind of different processes that are being shown here. Um, in the observations, we're seeing the highest peaks in the most energetic periods of ebb and flood, which would be um, diagnostic of re resuspension during the most energetic periods. In the model, what we're seeing is um, more of the large scale gradient where we have very high concentrations in the delta that move downstream on ebb tide and then move back upstream on uh, flood tide. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, the largest excursion of the high sediment water from the delta moving out the Golden Gate is um, near the end of uh, ebb tide. Um, and the, the lowest is near the end of flood tide when the water near the Golden Gate is dominated by water that's come back um, from the ocean. So, it's really these, um, this main feature of the model uh, predicting higher concentrations here quite near the end of ebb um, and then not capturing um, this uh, spike in concentrations on flood tide that, um, that really is a, the focus for trying to understand um, these differences. In terms of looking at the um, predicted sediment flux, um, you know, the one of the really big advantages of using the model is we can provide estimates of sediment flux over larger time scales. So, you know, in this case, the USGS went out and measured for 16 and a half hours. Um, but with the model, um, in this example, we're showing predictions across four and a half months where we have flux going back and forth each tidal cycle um, with a cumulative um, sediment flux, you know, uh, punctuated by these big events. Um, the observations are really a critical element of this because, you know, we can model things, but unless we have data to um, validate the model, it's hard to know uh, whether we're seeing uh, the right processes. And another thing um, that's important to keep in mind, there are there is uncertainty both in the model and the observations. You know, in the model, we're trying to parameterize relatively complicated physics um, of sediment and hydrodynamics. Um, in the observations, we have a boat going back and forth with a you know measurement trying to um, understand what's going on with both the sediment and the velocity um, in a pretty complex environment. So there are you know there's certainly um, uh, uncertainty in both, but they're really um, together necessary uh, to move the science forward. So our overall goal is to improve estimates of the sediment flux at the Golden Gate over larger timescales. 
uh, the combination of field data collection and modeling can improve our uh, understanding of the sediment flux. Here's an example just of the model predictions of sediment flux over um, the daily sediment flux over uh, four and a half months. And these long-term um, sediment flux estimates are really essential for um, developing accurate sediment budgets for the bay. Thanks, Maureen and Michael. I am going to forward, um, repeat, uh, a couple of clarifying questions before going to um, the next speaker. So again, um, from George Robertson, there is a question related to the flood tide, also bringing in plankton. Um, would that show up in your backscatter? So that may be a question for Maureen in terms of your instrumentation. Um, I don't know explicitly the answer to that question. Um, we definitely were, the, the, the samples that we were calibrating to, the water samples, they, they likely would have had uh, phytoplankton in them. Um, and we were looking at the sort of the filtered mass. Um, to my knowledge, the, the phytoplankton tend to be slightly less visible than, um, than the sediment particles themselves, but uh, I actually don't know the answer to that. It's a great question. Okay. Um, this question, Michael, is directed at you from Paul Work. What is your hypothesis for difference in flow patterns as the tide is turning more shear in observations than model? Um, the the differences in the more in in the sediment flux size. Yeah, I think I think the the this is something we're really just starting to to look at to try and understand better. Um, and it's really tricky to understand because we're looking at um, essentially one flood tide and one ebb tide, which occurs kind of on the falling limb of a you know high outflow period. Um, so. Uh, I want to be careful not to speculate too much based on you know one n equals one um, for one flood and one ebb tide, um, but we are hoping to look at some of the other periods um, that uh, Maureen looked at, looked at, and we've also been kind of trying to compare these you know sediment concentrations at the Golden Gate to some of the other stations like Alcatraz, um, where we where we actually see kind of both patterns. You know we see the the increase in the most energetic period, but we also see the increase at the end of ebb. Um, so I think. I think probably the reality is that um, it's a little bit of both that we may not be, I mean, we're not capturing everything in the model that's going on and there may be some elements um, in the observations where we're not um, capturing all of the complexity of what's going on as well. And it's, it's always, um, I mean, uh, Maureen can definitely speak to this too. I think I mean, their fit was extremely good between backscatter and um, measurements for, for what they have. Um, but there's always complexity in, ter in terms of relating backscatter to sediment. If the grain size changes across the tidal cycle or other things like that, um, that can affect um, uh, those estimates as well. There are plenty more questions coming in. One is related to uncertainty, and I think that's going to be a longer answer. So I'm going to save that for later. I'm just going to ask or repeat one other question that is probably a quick answer um, from Ann Libin. Does the model and or the sampling dates account for weather in the Sierra and the Central Valley? Yes, the model we're using all of the, you know, the inflows to the Delta. So we're capturing all of those inflows and, and you know, we're actually using also yes, yes measurements of sediment inflow to the Delta at all of those boundaries. So it's actually both measurements, you know, not, not these Golden Gate flux measurements, but the USGS has um, measurements of sediment flux to the delta that feed into the model. So we, we are trying to capture the full complexity of the um, you know, entire system, at least up, upstream to the, the tidal portions of the delta. Thank you, Michael and Maureen. There will be plenty of questions for you uh, when we get to our discussion, but I am gonna uh, move to our last speaker. I'm going to introduce um, Scott Dusterhoff. Scott Dusterhoff is a senior scientist and lead geomorphologist at the San Francisco Estuary Institute with a background in fluvial geomorphology, watershed hydrology, and estuarine and tidal wetland dynamics. He specializes in understanding the impacts of land disturbance and climate change on geomorphic processes um, and aquatic habitat for a variety of endangered species as well. Scott leads the RMP's sediment work group, along with many other projects in the San Francisco Bay Area that focus on, you guessed it, sediment. Scott, can you share your screen? <laughs> 
Thank you. And let me give it a go here. Okay, one moment. Okay, well, thank you, Louisa, and good morning, everyone. Um, we've had a great session so far. We've had some great talks, and I'm excited to finish us out here and look towards the future and actually move into the Baylands and describe the findings from the recently completed Sediment for Survival report. So this report looks at the future of Bayland sediment demand and how that compares to the future of sediment supply and uses those findings to develop a suite of management recommendations focused on supporting long-term Bayland resilience. So in my time here with you, I'm gonna provide a high-level overview of the report findings and focus on the main takeaway messages. So this effort and this report were completed this year. Uh, the report came out in April. Uh, this effort was led primarily by SFEI scientists with one of our co-authors, Nate Kaufman, from outside the Institute. Uh, funding for this effort came from both the EPA's Water Quality Improvement Fund, as well as the Bay RMP. And this project, uh, or this effort is part of a larger EPA funded project called Healthy Watersheds, Resilient Baylands that had several regional partners, including the San Francisco Estuary Partnership, who was the grant recipient and project lead, the regional board, BCDC, San Francisco Bay Joint Venture, BAFPA, and several other regional partners. And this effort also benefited greatly from a variety of folks that I want to just acknowledge here briefly. Uh, our technical advisory committee shown there on the left, our management advisory committee shown there on the right, as well as additional folks on the slide here that provided essential uh, guidance and support and review and data sets that were needed to do the analyses that we did. And I wanna give particular thanks to the folks shown on this slide that are here with us this morning. Okay, so tidal marshes, as we all know, are incredibly valuable ecosystems that provide a range of services, natural shoreline protection, water filtration, habitat. And over the last 200 years, we've lost thousands of acres of marsh around the bay but we as a region are committed to bringing back much of that lost habitat. So in the early 1800s, we had about 200,000 acres of tidal marsh around the bay. Today, we have something closer to 50,000 acres. But through the Bailing Goals effort in the late 90s, we as a region committed to getting back to 100,000 acres of tidal marsh. And getting back to that much marsh is going to require a lot of sediment, a lot of mud. Uh, due in large part to the fact that many of the areas that we want to turn back into tidal marsh are currently deeply subsided holes in the ground. Okay, these were areas that were diked off historically and then drained so that uh, they could be farmed or they could be developed. And that diking and draining and drying has caused these areas to sink in elevation over the past 200 years. And many of them are several feet below uh, mean sea level. So bringing those areas up to current marsh elevation is going to require a lot of sediment. And to date, the LTMS program or the Long-Term Management Strategy for Dredging program in the Bay has been responsible for getting sediment to many of these deeply subsided areas to help them turn back in to tidal marshes. So the LTMS program has a long-term goal for how to handle sediment that's dredged from the Bay. Okay, that's sediment taken out of shipping channels, ports, harbors, refineries. And the LTMS uh, calls for about 40% of that dredge sediment going towards beneficial reuse and much of that going to marsh restoration projects. So what you see here on the right is a map of the bay and green showing those restoration projects where dredge sediment has been placed to date and orange and yellow showing where there are plans to bring dredge sediment to restoration projects in the future. And so far, the LTMS program has provided over 25 million cubic yards of dredge sediment to help restore over 7,500 acres of tidal marsh. So dredge sediment is a big part of the marsh restoration story in the Bay. And looking towards the future, we know that climate change is gonna be providing challenges with respect to supporting our marshes over the long term. So as climate continues to change and sea level continues to rise, 
our marshes are going to need more sediment falling on them and depositing to help them build up in elevation and keep pace with that sea level rise. Uh, because if they don't keep pace, they will drown and no longer be tidal marshes. And the best available science is telling us that come mid-century, so just a couple decades from now, the rate of sea level rise is going to increase dramatically, which means our marshes will need even more sediment falling on them and depositing to help them build an elevation and be resilient over the long term. So what we see here on the left is a map of San Francisco Bay with the tidal marshes we have out there today shown in dark green the areas where we're planning to restore tidal marshes shown in the green crosshatch, and then the brown showing tidal flats or mud flats. And I think it's important to point out that within this effort, we looked at the sediment needed to support both marshes and mud flats because together they make a complete ecosystem and we know that we can't have healthy marshes without healthy mud flats. So within this effort, we really focused on addressing three key sediment questions. First, how much sediment do we think will be needed to support our marshes and our mudflats, what we're calling baylands, uh, into the future under a rising sea level? Second, how much natural sediment supply do we think is going to be available to our marshes and our mudflats in the future? And then, spoiler, we don't think there's gonna be enough natural sediment supply, so how can we get more? What are the additional sources of sediment that we can call upon to get onto our marshes and mudflats and help them build up an elevation and keep pace with sea level rise. So this is where we focused our effort. So in looking at the future of bayland sediment demand and sediment supply, we considered a few scenarios. First, we looked at how much sediment will be needed to keep our existing baylands, our existing marshes and mudflats, and also how much sediment will be needed to keep what we have and to restore 24,000 acres of tidal marsh. And this is the amount that we call for in the bayland goals effort. Second, we looked at two sea level rise projections, 1.9 feet of sea level rise between now and 2050, and then an additional five feet of sea level rise between 2050 and 2100. And these numbers come straight from the 2018 State of California sea level rise guidance document, and they are associated with a moderate to high degree of risk aversion with respect to shoreline planning. And then finally, we looked at two futures with respect to precipitation and runoff, which then gets us to sediment supply to the bay from both the delta and the local tributaries. So it's a foregone conclusion that our future will be warmer. But in this part of California, climate models are not in agreement on whether our future will be wetter, average annual precipitation will go up, or our future will be drier, average annual precipitation will go down. So within our analysis, we looked at both a wetter future and a drier future. Okay, so what did we find? Well, we found that we'll need approximately 450 million cubic yards of sediment by the end of this century to support all the marshes and mudflats we have out there today and to do all the marsh restoration that we're planning on doing. Okay, so how much sediment is that really? Well, it's enough to fill a cylinder about this size um, so here we have the Bay Bridge, downtown San Francisco. It's uh, almost twice the amount of sediment that was taken out of the ground to build the Panama Canal. And it's enough sediment to fill 45 million dump trucks, which if put end to end, would circle the equator 10 times. So it is an incredible amount of sediment. And I think it's important to point out that 100 million cubic yards of this is needed just to fill those deeply subsided holes in the ground and get them up to current marsh elevation. Okay, so where is all of this sediment going to come from? Well, we think we can get about a third of it from what I'm calling here our current landscape and current management approaches. So what does that mean? Well, it means depositional processes. Okay, so the tides coming onto our marshes and our mudflats, and as the tide slows down, sediment in suspension dropping out before the tide recedes. Okay, so natural depositional processes can help us get there. And so can using dredge sediment as we have been to date. Okay, using dredge sediment to fill deeply subsided areas to help bring them up to marsh elevation before restoring them. Okay, so those two things can get us part of the way there. But what about the rest? What about that remaining 70%? Well, the, the good news, okay, the good news is that we think we have this sediment in the region 
We just need to be, bring about new management approaches to get that sediment, um, to, get, to get that in-bay and watershed sediment onto our marshes and our mudflats where it can deposit and help them build up an elevation over time and be resilient to a changing climate. And there's really three uh, sources of sediment that we think we should be calling on. The first is dredge sediment. So currently uh, about 3 million cubic yards of sediment is dredged from the bay every year. And as I pointed out earlier, 40% um, of that currently goes towards beneficial reuse. So since we think we're facing this large deficit, uh, it seems that we should be finding ways to bring that sediment that's not currently going towards beneficial reuse to our marsh restoration projects and using it for long-term valence support. Next is upland excavated sediment. So this is sediment taken from construction projects around the region. So currently about 2 million cubic yards of sediment is taken from construction projects to landfill every year as a waste product. So again, since it seems that we will be facing this deficit in the coming years, uh, we should be finding ways to divert those trucks. And instead of having them go to landfills, have them go down to the baylands where that sediment can be, can be deposited and used for restoration and long-term valence support. And then the third source of sediment is upland reservoir sediment. So this is the sediment trapped behind our dams in the Bay Area. So we predict that by the end of the century, we could have somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 million cubic yards of sediment trapped within our reservoirs. So again, because of this Bayland sediment deficit, it seems we should be finding ways to get that sediment out from behind the dams and moved downstream where it can help uh, with long-term Bayland resilience. So this report really points to three types of management actions uh, needed to support long-term Bayland health and resilience. So essentially what we call a three-legged stool approach to management. And in the near term, it really focuses on dredge sediment. Okay, using more dredge sediment for direct placement, so getting directly onto the marshes that we are restoring, and also placing it strategically, placing it adjacent to our marshes so that uh, the tide can move that sediment up into the water column and then move it on to marshes and mudflats where it can deposit and help them build up over time. We also talk about two other longer term management strategies. So not longer term in the sense that we can wait to act on them, but longer term in the sense that it will take a while for them to be realized. And the first is the protection of marsh migration space. So we don't get into this too deeply in the report because we are laser focused on sediment, but we know that if given the opportunities, given the opportunity, marshes will migrate inland with a rising sea level. So it seems that we should be finding opportunities to protect that low gradient open space that's just inland of our marshes now, so that as sea level rise, those can be the spaces where marshes migrate into. And then the last piece here is an updated approach to watershed management. Okay, so this includes things like redesigning our dams to pass sediment. So when our dams need to be torn down and rebuilt for seismic purposes or for other purposes, we should find ways to bring online technologies that can get sediment through those dams and downstream and then ultimately out to our balins. And it also includes bringing online environmental flows within our regulated watersheds. Okay, so this includes pulsed flows in the wintertime to move fine sediment on our creek beds downstream and out to the balins, and also a slower ramp down of flows from winter to spring to summer to again, help move fine sediment downstream. And then the last piece here down at the watershed Balin interface, so down at the shoreline, is finding opportunities to reconnect our creeks to our Balins. Okay, so those sediment laden storm flows that come out of our watersheds, instead of blowing past the Balins and going out to the bay, can actually spread out onto our Balins and drop that sediment and help them build up an elevation over time. So finally, this report highlights the need to manage sediment regionally, but also develop place-based strategies that integrate watershed and balance management. Okay, so getting those that manage watersheds to coordinate with those that manage balance to develop a portfolio of management approaches that get flows and sediment out of watersheds and then onto our balance. And where possible, having nature be that engine that moves the flow and sediment, um, because we know that always will be the cheapest solution, but also where appropriate, getting dredge sediment placed directly onto our marshes and also placed strategically adjacent to our marshes 
so that the tide can move that sediment up on to our balins and help them build an elevation and keep pace with sea level rise. And then in closing here, I think it's important to point out that the RMP sediment work group really has a big role to play in doing the science that informs sediment management and balin resilience. Okay, this, this work group is new. We've only been around for a few years, um, but we're already funding some great special studies. Uh, the two that you heard about previously, funding for those two studies came uh, from uh, the RMP sediment work group. And we're currently funding many other studies that are helping advance sediment science in the Bay. And those findings will then ultimately help advance sediment management. And just a few efforts to, to highlight here. Uh, we have a, a special study now that looks at sediment bioaccumulation guidance. So it's essentially revisiting the bioaccumulation thresholds for dredge sediment. And the findings may actually help us use more dredge sediment for beneficial reuse. We also have a few studies at play that focus on monitoring and modeling sediment flux between subembayments and also at the Golden Gate, as you just heard earlier. We also have several studies at play looking at uh, monitoring and modeling sediment flux from the bay onto our marshes. And then we're currently working on a baywide sediment conceptual model where we are um, synthesizing all the information that we have related to sediment movement and deposition in the bay to tell the kind of high level story of sediment in the bay and the that model ultimately helping us understand how sediment gets onto our marshes and our mudflats and ultimately help us understand how to manage that sediment better. So that's a high level overview of the sediment uh, for survival report um, and just a little bit of information about what's going on in the RMP sediment work group. Uh, you can get a copy of the report at the top URL here. Uh, the bottom URL can take you to the sediment um, to the RMP work groups page where you can find out more about the sediment work group and, and all the RMP work groups. So thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. Um, I'm going to pass on a few clarifying questions before we bring it into the larger group discussion. Um, there's a question from Greg Reese. How does the 450 million cubic yards compare to the late 1800s hydraulic mining source or you know, when that happened? Um, just in terms of context, that's kind of an interesting way to frame it. Do we know? So, so 450 million cubic yards is how much sediment we're going to need. Um, for the Balins to survive a rising sea level. And so the question is, what is that magnitude of the size of that hockey puck? Like, how does that compare to the amount of sediment that was coming up? Right, so if we were still getting that same amount of sediment coming out of the Sierra that we were getting in the early 1900s, would that, would that do it for us? Um, good question. I'm sure it would, because I, I haven't done that calculation. Yeah, so I, okay. can't, I can't give the true answer, but it would, it would help. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, sure. we're, we're certainly not wanting that to be uh, the new source, but just in terms of context, given yeah, right. that there was the slug at that one time, knowing what that amount was would be kind of interesting. Right. Um, and then when you were mentioning, this is a, a question from Sean N um, about the, the non-alignment of the two climate models. One, there's some uncertainty that leads you to thinking towards a wetter future and, and another potential climate model that um, predicts a drier, drier yeah. future. Right. So what is, will those ever be aligned? Um, where are those models coming from? That's a good question. And I'm not a climate modeler, so I, I can't truly kind of talk about the future of climate modeling. But I think the, the short, high level, you know, relatively uninformed answer is that they're looking, they're look, they have different inputs and they're looking at kind of different um, controlling factors in uh, climate projections. So that's why there's, you know, if you look, if you focus on, certain things in your model, it'll take you towards a slightly wetter future. If you focus on other things in your model, it'll take you to a slightly drier future. So I think that's that's just a quick answer. Great. Um, if we could have all the panelists um, turn their cameras on and I'm gonna, we have a lot of questions. I think I will, we have until 1040 for our discussion. I will try to get as many questions to you as possible. Um, but also as a reminder to be able to answer all of them, try to keep your answers as brief as possible. Um, and if we don't get to your question, we will also strive to have the panelists um, reply to them on this Q and A um, and, and be able to share with you so you can see, see answers that are not um, answered live. Um, 
so while we still just have Scott on his role, um, question from Chris Summers about the estimate of the amount of sediment from construction sites and reservoirs. Um, how did you generate that estimate? And um, this is this is a question also that's in other um, questioners. The the issue of contaminated sediment. Um, right. How do you factor that in? Sure. Right. So I'll answer the first questions first. Um, so Chris, so that 2 million cubic yards per year, that number came from Nate Kaufman and the work that he's, his research for his PhD at UC Berkeley. Um, and I, I don't want to get too deeply into it because I don't know all the ins and outs, but, um, he, but we do get into it in the report. Uh, so I, I think the high level answer is Nate did the best he could um, to contact all the landfills in the region to get a sense from all the operators, how much sediment they're getting every year. Um, and he's got a, a long-term record, I think, over the past decade or so about the, the annual amount of, of sediment that's, take from, that's taken from construction sites to landfills in, in the Bay Area. So that's the quick answer there. Um, and sorry, there was a second piece before getting to contamination. What was the second? No, no, um, contamination. Okay. How do you factor in that as part of supply and having to screen the sediment? Yeah, right. So that's a good question. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure either. And I guess, you know, it's easy for me to say, um, Hey, we should divert those trucks and take those trucks down to, you know, down to the Baylands. But, you know, the reality is that um, some of that sediment is contaminated, is contaminated and is not suitable, you know, for marsh cover material. So that does need to keep going to landfills, but, you know, there also is a conversation to have thinking about Montezuma where there could be instances where contaminated sediment could be used as base material, if we have confidence that it is sealed off from the ecosystem and can be then clean material put on top. And I, I do think that since the deficit we're facing does look quite large, we do need to get creative about how to fill all these deep holes. And I, I don't think over the long term we want to be using clean sediment to be filling the bottom of these holes if we can help it. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to a question that was asked pretty early on by Jim McGrath, and it has to do with the Alcatraz disposal site. So this may be um, Bruce, Maureen, and Michael, some thoughts on whether the, the long-term data sets that you were developing and then the modeling, is, is Alcatraz, the deposition of, of material there, does that show up um, in any of your data sets as a, as a blip? How do, we, how do we understand that part of the bay? I think I'll take a shot at that. Thank you for the question, Jim. Yes, it does show up very strongly. It, uh, going through the, the change maps, it, you know, quickly you couldn't, uh, couldn't focus on it, but it is a very strong uh, depositional signal. And I, if I recall correctly, it's you know, on the order of five to 10 million cubic meters. I can jump in. Um, the USGS, the project of which I used to be a part of, um, there's a long-term turbidity sensor located at the Alcatraz Island on the, the east side of the island. And to my knowledge, we've not seen any sort of resuspension signal that might have been from the disposal site. And so, um, so we, anyway, there are longer long-term suspended sediment concentration data but to my knowledge, there's not a resuspension signal at the tidal time scale. Okay, thank you. Um, from, from Richard Looker, um, this has to do with uncertainty um, in, in modeling this flux. So I'm gonna read it because it's long. Um, about how, is there any way to evaluate the magnitude of the uncertainty in the longer term modeled flux estimates resulting from the relatively sparse temporal resolution of the ADCP sampling. Am I right in thinking that this depends on how well your large outflow even represents a typical large outflow event? I can, I can start. Um, so th there certainly is a, a lot of uncertainty in the ADCP measurements themselves. So just some of the examples are um, the instrument itself is located uh, approximately two meters below the water surface. So we're missing the very surface layer and then there's also at near the bed, there's a, a blanking distance uh, where we can't see the bottom. And then there's, uh, we can't get all the way to the edges of the channel. And so there's a really pretty, I mean, the, the, the Golden Gate cross section is very large. And so the percentage of the cross section that's actually measured is pretty high compared to maybe like a smaller channel. 
but it is there is still quite a lot of uh, interpolation and even extrapolation that is happening to use the data. Um, and I think like the bigger concern of uncertainty is if you think about the hydrograph of the watershed inflow, the sediment plume that came from the storms um, from the Central Valley, uh, thinking about like where we decided to make our measurements on that bigger picture hydrograph, I think that's like one of the biggest challenges and sources of uncertainty is so it, the, like the, think about the sediment plume is continually evolving at the Golden Gate and we're just out there for this, you know, 16 hour period um, and decide, you know, if we were 24 hours earlier, we would probably have a different amount of data. And so the short is yes, there's a lot of uncertainty and, um, and that's why it's important to work with people like Michael to try to help um, investigate and constrain some of these questions. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to the to the modeling side too. I mean, um, I think your your question, Richard, gets really right to the point: is that it, it, there is some challenges in understanding the uncertainty because we're <clears throat> we have short temporal resolution of the ACP sampling, and so even you know in the February uh, 2017 period, we have one flood and one ebb. Um, but you have to keep in mind on every day we have two floods and two ebbs and they're not all equal in magnitude so even you know with one flood and one ebb we could be seeing something that we wouldn't actually see across uh, the entire day um, and then on the other samplings we have in uh, 2016 we have you know single floods and single ebbs but they're not um, they're not contiguous I don't think um, in terms of the the day so we have, you know, we don't even have um, measurements yet of an entire tidal day, which would require, you know, probably <laughs> probably superhuman effort to be out there for 25 hours straight um, doing transects. But, you know, even even within our um, our resolution of our sampling, you know, we don't have a full two, flo two, two floods and two ebbs in a, in a day to look at that, how that all balances out so that you're, you know, beginning and ending at the same um, water level. I think one of the big challenges is that you know, the data sets, all three of them um, show that the, a larger sediment flux into the bay um, than out of the bay from the observation. And so that was really one of the motivations of the modeling study is because that, you know, that finding across three different samplings um, is really counterintuitive to our conceptual model and essentially all of the sediment budgets we've ever made for the bay. Um, you know, that, you know, like we're seeing in these very short temporal periods, more sediment coming in. Um, so I think, you know, that's really what we're, we're trying to look at and, um, you know, understanding whether whether that's that's real. I mean, there are some other questions um, related to the same topic about the model systemically showing like, you know, larger ebb sediment flux than than the data. But, there's, you know, we're also just trying to understand if there's something missing um, in the data that we're not fully understanding correctly, too, because it's not a it's not a we can actually go out and measure exactly how much sediment is going through, you know, we're doing our using the best technology we have to look down through the water column, um, combine that with some um, spot sampling and, and come up with estimates. So I think it's important to keep in mind that um, they're both estimates and, um, you know, by using them together, we can try and get them, if we can get them to converge, that gives us a lot more confidence in the uncertainty. Um, and I think we did that and, you know, in, in the Dumbarton uh, data set when we looked at um, the initial sediment flux estimates down there um, almost about a decade ago when we did the modeling, we said, oh, well, we get a different sediment flux direction than you guys got. And we looked at the different sensors and looked at, you know, flocculation and there's a whole bunch of more research that went in and um, it actually had implications even for the, the, the prediction of the direction of sediment flux. So we may find something here as we dig into this more. Um, it's not always is as simple as saying one's right and the other's wrong. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I think the answer is probably somewhere in between. So there's a, a series of questions from Mark Silos, which is asking for clarification of understanding sediment supply in the Bay as it relates to the Delta, Delta as a source, um, but also if we were able to do a lot of um, marsh creation with beneficial reuse of dredged material, would that affect um, sediment, suspended sediment concentrations in the Delta and, and vice versa? It can people speak to um, the relationship between sediment supply in the Bay and the Delta? Well, I guess one thing I can, can say quickly is it, thinking about sediment um, or thinking about restoration in the Delta. Um, if there is large scale restoration in the Delta, then the Delta becomes a sediment sink. And so for instance, the projection that I had about future sediment supply did not account for 
for all that restoration. So I'm not going to say the bay suffers if the delta if delta restoration moves forward in a big way, but there is an implication that if we do a lot of the restoration in the delta that we want to do and sediment starts to get trapped there um, in those restoration projects, it, it will affect the supply of sediment to the bay and therefore affects um, long-term resilience of, of bay marshes. So there is, you know, there are considerations there. Does anyone else want to speak to the work that they've done in the Bay and how it may or may not relate to what needs to be done for the Delta? Um, I can just say, I know that there's work underway um, to, we, we, the, the USGS has some sensors uh, located like at Mallard Island. And so there's a lot of work to try to refine the estimates of sediment, like entering the Bay from the Delta. And um, there's, Definitely other USGS researchers like Scott Wright and Dan Hot that would have a lot of uh, really good like field observations of delta sediment dynamics. Okay, thank you. Um, I just let me just please, add go ahead, to that. Yes, please. Yeah. So, you know, when looking at uh, whether the bays erosional or depositional, not taking into to account human you know, activities, there's a very clear relationship between how much sediment's coming into the bay and how much is either deposited or eroded, you know. So that's, that's a big piece of the puzzle is how much is coming in. I'm gonna to try to fit in two more questions. Um, this very cleverly worded question from Matt Ferner on the liberation of fine sediments from behind dams. Um, what, what do we think the likelihood of that? And what about contamination that may also be in, in, in those areas? Right. So I guess likelihood, um, good question. I guess that's, you know, the hope is that, you know, this research and other research that's coming out now just is waving a big red flag. So maybe 10 years ago, the likelihood might've been low because we're like, oh, it's, it's so expensive. It's how can we even think about doing it? But since we know that our baylands are going to need more sediment than we think they're going to get naturally. We need we need to start getting creative. So back to your likelihood question, I'm not sure. But, you know, for instance, there are um, efforts at play. So uh, Don Pedro Reservoir in the East Bay, there is an effort underway to investigate um, the feasibility of, uh, I, I believe, installing a slurry pipe to get reservoir sediment out, moved downstream in a slurry pipe, and then out to Eden Landing. So we are starting to get creative. It's still expensive. And so that's always, you know, going to be the hurdle. Um, but what's the alternative? If the alternative is losing balins, you know, we need to start, we need to start doing that math. Um, so I guess that's just a quick answer to your first question. Your second question, um, contamination, of course, that's also a consideration. So all that sediment is not going to be suitable um, for balins. Uh, but hopefully, you know, we can figure out those reservoirs that do have suitable sediment and start coming up with some ideas there. Um, Scott, we also have a very pointed question from Ellen Jock about migration space as part of the strategy mm -hmm. being talked about um, in, in the report. Um, is that she's asking whether that's a program that needs to be built in our minds as equivalent to things like building reservoirs? Um, is it? Is it that level of effort? I mean, I, I personally think it should be. And again, it's not it's not appropriate everywhere. You know, we're really talking about the big open spaces in like in the North Bay and the South Bay, where there's these low gradient um, alluvial valleys that are just inland of our marshes. Um, there's plenty of places, you know, Central Bay, Marin County, those areas where it's too steep and there's not a lot of opportunity. But where those opportunities exist, Again, you know, it, it is going to be over the long term cheapest for us to, you know, step back and let marshes move inland if they can. There's money involved in pur purchasing the land, obviously, and there's money involved in making sure the land is suitable for marsh habitat, that there's, there's no contamination or those types of issues. But in terms of then not having to truck sediment to dump to keep a marsh where it currently is, you know, it is always going to be cheaper to let marshes move inland. Um, in those low gradient areas. So, I mean, I personally think that it should be a, a big effort of ours now uh, to be protecting those, um, those low gradient areas. 
Thank you, panelists on sediment very much. We have reached our time. Um, and I, I do see that there are plenty of other uh, questions and we'll work with the panelists to get answers to your questions and, and record that as part of our, our session. Thank you for joining us. I think I am turning it over to either Melissa or Tom at this point. Great, Thanks, Lisa. Thank, thank you, Louisa. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, we are now going to take a break and we will come back at 10.55. So we'll see you in, in 13 minutes.